the Jacob Buer show, I am so happy to be joined by somebody who just broke history recently, Jared Isaacman, who was on the Polaris Dawn SpaceX mission, private, and you completed the first human spacewalk as a non-astronaut, well, I shouldn't say non-astronaut, as a private civilian. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. So take me through a little bit. How did you end up, how did space become your passion? There's so many things in this world. How did space become your passion? I I mean, I, I was a kid that dreamed of being an astronaut someday. So uh, all the way back to kindergarten. And um, I became a pilot for that reason, because I thought that was as good as it was going to get and built, um, you know, an interesting aviation career and then had an opportunity in 2020 um, to put together inspiration for so, you know, the first all civilian mission to orbit, um, that was really just to show that it could be done and, you know, some foundational steps for doing science and research in space, but mostly just to send an inspirational message that this is on the horizon here. Um, and, uh, you know, we are getting closer to really unlocking that last great frontier. When I came back from that meeting with SpaceX and, uh, and Elon, uh, you know, we we started talking about the the big gap between Dragon and the capabilities that exist today in space and Starship, which is a multi generational leap. Um, I mean, in in a in an instant, uh, so much is going to change. But in order to hit the ground running, there's a lot we could do. Um, you know, between where we're at today and then, you know, new spacesuits uh, for hundreds or thousands of people, new communication methods. Um, you know, new system architecture for high radiation environments, just a lot. And that's what ultimately kind of, you know, gave birth to the Polaris program and and now our first mission, Polaris on. And you, of course, have two more missions coming over the next few years. Um, for you, of course, what was the, I guess, most fascinating thing through the training process this time around that was different from last time? Well, there's just a lot more to get done. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, with Inspiration4, again, it was largely just showing that we can get this done. Like we can we can do this safely um, and uh, and maybe inspire people again about a, a really exciting future in space. And again, foundational things like we did science and research on it. But with Polaris Dawn, um, it's a development program. Uh, when the when the Polaris Dawn was created, there there, there was no EVA suits yet. Uh, there was no software architecture for recovering from, you know, high radiation faults in, um, you know, in the Van Allen belt, uh, you know, laser links uh, between two spacecraft moving 17,500 miles an hour, one of which being a human spaceship uh, was not even on the drawing board yet. So there was a lot of things that needed to be built uh, and then needed to be tested, um, you know, in order to fly this mission and get it all done. Um, not to mention, we, we increased the science and research workload um, by like, 10x uh, throughout the mission duration. So it's just a lot to get prepared for so that you could quite literally do some of these things in your sleep because um, because I'd say we were all pretty exhausted up there uh, and went nonstop for five days. <laughs> and fun question I got asked this time around, obviously it had to have been just totally different being in a capsule. I've been at summer camp where you've had 30 people in a bedroom before, but at least I had like eight or nine feet to myself still. Um, or in a dorm room, at least at my side. Being in space, though, um, were you able to sleep better this time around than last time, or was that really not a problem? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, Dragon by spaceship standards is rather roomy, so we have a fair amount of volume. We never bump into each other. We never like encroach on each other's space. Like uh, we actually can divide it up into multiple levels and just get things done, um, you know, simultaneously. So volume is fine. Sleep was not fine. Um, the uh, we just simply ran out of time every day and had to keep pressing. Um, so you know we this is a crew that you know we were very determined not to um, not to leave anything behind. Like we had to get it all done, and that meant going way deep into our sleep schedule every night. So we 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 uh, uncovered new ways to I think. Um, stretch the the human endurance without sleep, which mostly involved uh, chocolate covered espresso beans. And uh, and we were able to get it all done and, and catch up on some sleep when we got home. And just one last question on that, I got to ask, um, what is kind of the average time that you were able to sleep in space? Three to four hours that I'm assuming? I think probably, 
you know, some nights there were zero and some nights there were three. Um, but uh, I don't think anyone really got a full night's sleep or even close to it. It just uh, there just wasn't the time. Wow. Fascinating and makes it seem even more awesome what you guys were able to do up there, pushing the human body to the limits. Um, what's a takeaway that you would want younger generations? Obviously, I go to Purdue University. Purdue's known for STEM. Very happy for that, um, as well as a lot of other schools. What's the takeaway you would want for younger people to get from um, your most recent mission and going forward with the Polaris program? Well, I think like uh, it's it's probably less about Polaris Dawn and just more what's on the horizon is that the opportunities um, to make real progress in space um, is just on the horizon. Um, you know, uh, Starship will be, again, a multi-generational leap in capabilities. And with that is going to, you know, create all sorts of additional problems and challenges that need to be solved. Um, it's great that you can have, uh, armadas of starship go to Mars. Um, but, uh, you know, how about keeping people, you know, healthy and sane along that journey? We've had nothing like that. There are no analogs on earth for it. We haven't done surgery in space. There's no childbirth in space. No one's grown up in sub one G, uh, before, you know, uh, when you're on the moon, um, you can look at Earth and be home in two and a half days. When you're on the space station, you can look at Earth and be at home in two and a half hours. Um, nine months every two years in, in on Mars, looking at a blue speck in the sky is going to be uh, a mental game changer <laughs> for a lot of people. Uh, we don't know what uh, the economic reason is for people to be in space. We just know we want people in space because it's a great thing to be a spacefaring civilization. And who knows what we uh, may stand to learn along the way, but we don't have actually a reason economically to do it. Um, you know, there's there's no 3D printing organs yet. There's no new forms of energy yet. Uh, there's no manufacturing or asteroid mining, but yet all these things are going to be in the realm of possible once Starship comes online. So I guess it's just, there is a lot to do and it's going to take a new generation of dreamers to kind of figure it all out um, for the good of everyone. And it's kind of exciting. No doubt about it. And something that's really fascinating is obviously you've had a great business career um, and, you know, now you're kind of doing a lot of great things in aerospace. How is confidence? Because you hear confidence a lot of times with the Gen Z generation or the millennial generation or just anybody, really. It doesn't matter what generation you are. How has confidence been a game changer for you and everything you've been able to do in your life? Um, that's interesting. Um, I think just I try and kind of put my energy towards things that I think I can be uh, successful in and leave the things that I'm not good at to others. So I guess in a way, how I've kind of prioritized my time and energy does give me, you know, a degree of confidence in the things that I can kind of move the needle on or, or advance the ball. And um, in my world, uh, outside of my day job, that's almost been exclusively in, um, in aerospace. Uh, so, you know, prior to space was in, you know, various um, defense, aerospace, government contracting that kind of um, created new training opportunities for uh, the U.S. military and our allies. And then, you know, in SpaceX is another great example that, you know, we've set out some really awesome objectives and, you know, we 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 develop to them, qualify, train to it. And that gives us confidence in that we can go out and achieve them. Um, and we got one proof point now, or, or I guess two with Inspiration4, but we need a lot more and, and a lot more missions out there uh, beyond just players. And for you, what is the importance of teamwork? I think that's something that people forget about because we have a social media world that's huge today. So when people get things done, it can be tough as a team. What's the biggest message on teamwork you'd have? I don't think we, I mean, well, look, at least, I mean, it's a great question in general, but with respect to just Polaris, like we don't accomplish any of this without a team. And really, I love I love going down the rabbit hole of, of teamwork um, because it starts so much farther back than you can even imagine. I mean, in the case of human spaceflight today, for sure, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, but you know, NASA, you know, without the foresight of the commercial crew program, there is no SpaceX, there's no inspiration for, there's no Polaris, there's no Axiom. Um, you know, it, it goes back to like an incre incredibly incredible organizational effort at NASA just to even give birth to an initiative like this. Then SpaceX, 14,000 people who show up for work every day believing that they can't make a greater impact in the world than, um, than clocking in at the office and giving it a thousand percent um because they they truly believe in the mission and vision that um 
you know, the world's a more interesting place when people can journey among the stars. There were literally, you know, hundreds of people between mission control and in the back shops, making sure that everything we encountered through every phase of flight, the high apogee radiation environment, you know, the EVA, the communications over Starlink, the support for science and research were in fact well supported. So, you know, a handful of people sometimes get, you know, the good view uh, or the front row seats, but uh, it takes an army behind them for it to be possible. And when you say that, I think back on Gene Cran, someone who has also been on this show, who obviously was not walking on the moon ever, but had quite a sacrifice down here in Mission Control. Um, and then just a few other questions I have is, what advice would you have for college students in STEM or business? Um, obviously, you've now been able to do both of those, business and the business world with building shit for payments, which I saw your product at the gym the other day when I was putting a credit card in and it made me think of you. And then um, obviously now in the space world with what you're doing, um, what's kind of what, what would your be what would your advice be for young people? Well, first I, I'd say like you know you gotta you gotta follow your passions um, and like the people that I've always enjoyed working uh, closest with are the best in their field um, because it's challenging. Like it in challenge it challenges you to be you know a, a better person when you know you're working alongside someone who is truly exceptional. I've never found somebody that was exceptional at what they do and hated it. Um, like literally, it was their passion. They lived it. They breathed it. So. For starters, you know, you know, direct yourself and, you know, towards what you are most excited about, something that you will, again, live and breathe long, you know, long after uh, business hours. So that's the first step. Um, and then when you're there, you know, you have to find the opportunity. And oftentimes the opportunity is what's the problem to solve, right? Um, and you kind of gravitate towards that. And this is very applicable for for whether it's business or just being part of a you know, a bigger global effort like uh, human space exploration, but where, where are the, you know, like put yourself in a position of immense expertise by following your passions and then um, apply that to the, to the biggest problem that you can, you can solve. And that's how you wind up on, on the fast track to, to really, really great things. Very good answer there, I'd say. Um, and then just a few other questions um, with the spacewalk, obviously it was totally different from how they do it on the space station it was back to apollo style which again is just crazy we haven't done that in a long time was there ever a moment of nerve or not so much because you had already been to space before so you had been through a take take off and splash down or were you were you more nervous when like that hatch finally opened and like okay now you're on a rope and you're kind of floating out there was there any nerve no um I, well first i you know appreciate the acknowledgement of it being different. I think that's so important. Um, you know, when people see the same thing over and over again, it doesn't like, I feel like the synapses don't fire as much like creativity and inspiration isn't, you know, at full force. When you see things that are different from time to time, it just causes you to think differently. And, you know, for everything that NASA accomplished during, you know, the early uh, space race, uh, that was four and a half percent of, you know, US GDP uh, essentially getting funneled in to accomplish those kind of things which was awesome. And we learned so much, but now, you know, we're, we're t thinking much bigger about space with hundreds and thousands of people, you know, a permanent presence on the moon, you know, Mars outposts really unlocking the mysteries of our universe. And, um, and that's going to take a lot of people and outside of the government and capabilities uh, like spacewalks, um, EVAs for the purpose of constructing and exploring and repairing is going to be essential to the commercial industry. So, by all accounts, our EVA was um, was uh, very simple and much more akin to the early space uh, space age. But it was important for commercial industry to understand these things. I'll say that we were incredibly well prepared for it. Um, we have literally choreographed that a uh, hundred times. Um, the uh, you know the automated hatch uh, not functioning was something that was considered a lot from just residual pressure and outflow from the suit. So we. I've probably done a hundred manual hatch openings and I was pretty excited to get the go for that. Um, so it, it was all something we were really uh, well prepared for, never felt nervous in any phase of it, uh, of the EVA. Um, tell you the only, the only area where you have nerves and I think it's on any mission is on reentry um, because you're helpless. Um, you know, the way uphill, you have lots of outs with launch escape system. You have a lot of control. 
Um, you're feeling good and excited, but at the end of the mission, you're tired, your body's deconditioned, the G's hurt more, and you know uh, that there is no alternative but to come down and you know, it all comes down to the heat shield. And um, in that high apogee environment we were in, uh, the uh, the risk associated with micrometeor micrometeoroids and um, orbital debris is way high. And it, it probably at that point came down to the highest risk phase of the mission. And you just don't know if you take a hit. So I'd say that's when everyone's blood pressure is up um, and you just got to be along for the ride. Wow. And and obviously with the heat shields, that goes back to Columbia. Um you know, debris and things like that. Um, would you also say that was it tough with the hatch open to transition when you and Sarah, um, the other crewmate, obviously, was that kind of a hard transition when she did it? Or was it, I mean, you're already floating in space for what, a few days at that point. Was there any struggle with that or no? No, I mean, again, we had we had drilled that a hundred times. Um, you know, the transitions under the display, um, you know, Sarah did awesome. Um, so yeah, that was all like, um, you know, that went clockwork. So no, no issues there. I feel horrible that she got, uh, the lousy view. Um, you know, we were in eclipse when she was out there and, um, I think she would even say though, that she needed every second just to get through the test. So, um, you know, she probably wasn't that disappointed. Um, and you know, the other thing was just a bummer on, on the amount of time out there, you know, we, we had budgeted enough oxygen for two hours from uh vent to repress and uh i think just some of the hatch troubles um probably you know caused mission control to want to keep carry a bigger margin for hatch closure and repress um so that was a little bit of a bummer but otherwise it went you know just as we had practiced for sure and to close out i always like to close out just three quick kind of questions would you ever walk on the moon if you were given the chance yes wow would you ever walk on mars if I was given the chance, uh, yes. Wow. Um, and then what is the, who, who inspired you from an early age if there was somebody in your life? Well, um, well, I don't know how early of an age. I mean, I got a, a young start on things, but, um, I'd say the two, you know, figures, um, most would be one in, in terms of my kind of uh, professional or business career with Steve Jobs. Um, I think one of the greatest entrepreneurs of the last, you know, half century. Uh, and, um, and I'd say in terms of going out and, you know, trying to undertake, uh, grand adventures for the benefit of everyone, it would be, uh, JFK. Wow. I thought you were about to say Richard Branson. He's done a lot of journeys too. Uh, and then my last question is what's next for you? So, um, you know, the mission kind of continues. Uh, we still uh, have a lot of uh, visits with the scientists and the docs over the next uh, couple months. Uh, our debriefs start Monday, uh, so tomorrow. Um, and then data review will start the next day. And that will continue through the balance of the year. And this is so important because um, we got to figure out, you know, what what we got right, what we got wrong, um, where there was a lot more room for improvement. And, and it's the understanding of that knowledge that allows us to think what's in the realm of possible for for what comes next to build upon it. And, and um, I imagine sometime in early 2025 is when we'll start thinking about what um, what the next Polaris mission will look like. Polaris 2 and then Polaris 3 after that on the Starship, if I'm correct. Yeah, we have some time for that one. Um, <laughs> but Polaris 2 will be up next. So. Well, I appreciate you coming on the Jacob Beer show today. Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, no, thanks for having me. This is a big part of our, you know, obligation coming back from space is to to share the experience with everyone. So thanks for helping uh, contribute to that. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Jacob Beer show today. And people can find you on social media if they want to see more of your journey at Ricky Isaacman, if I'm correct, on oh. X. Rook Instagram, Isaac. Rook Isaac, man, yeah. um, on X, Instagram and all that. So, well, thank you so much for coming on the Jacob Viewer show today. Sounds good. Thank you. Take care.